<laughs> you know? Well, that's, that's been a big debate. Do Trump all red voters actually exist? And I can tell you, <laughs> anecdotally, I know one. Maybe not the best sample size, uh, considering the sports, you know, angle there. But we'll, we'll take it. At least anecdotally, Brad knows of one Trump all red voter that exists. Are you saying a sample size of one isn't sufficient? Uh, yes. Interesting. Yes, I am. Huh. Okay. <laughs> Howdy, folks, and welcome back to another episode of the Weekly Roundup. I'm Mackenzie, here with Brad, Mary Elise, and Cameron. Howdy, folks. Mary Elise and Cameron, specifically, I want to jump to y'all. You guys were in full election mode here, and you both have a lot of um, exciting things you're attending this week. So, Mary Elise, we'll start with you. What are you, what are you going to in Houston? Yes, I am attending um, Kamala Harris's rally tomorrow in Houston. Um, which should be interesting. And I've been informed that there could be a free concert that Beyonce will be attending. So it should be, um, it should be an interesting event. Yeah. Is she attending or is she perform? And I know this is like TBD, but is it rumored that she's performing or just attending? I think right now it's just attending, but I wouldn't be surprised if she's showing up because Kamala Harris has had some other singers come to her rallies and then they end up singing. So. I guess we'll find out. Got it. Megan the Stallion. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and Lizzo, I think. I think both of those are maybe I'm wrong. I could be wrong, but regardless. That'll be an interesting rally to attend. Always interesting when you see a kind of pop culture and politics collide. And Cam, we have a a, a very prominent guest coming to Austin. Well, you said the crossover between pop culture and politics. We have our pop culture former president coming to Austin. <laughs> he's a, he's all in one. Yeah. And he's going to be giving remarks to the press. Um, Ted Cruz is going to be joining him. I think J.D. Vance too, right? J.D. Vance. So the whole gang is getting together. and The gang comes to Austin. <laughs> yeah. It's an always sunny in Philadelphia episode. Uh, it'll be fun, though. Um, yeah, uh, interested to see what they talk about. You know, um, if it's going to be focused on Cruz's Senate race or if they're going to be talking about the presidential race or I'm sure it'll be all those things. But, uh, yeah, it'll be fun. Exciting times. And, Brad, not to leave you out um, because, you know. I was going to say, what the heck? (laughs) My chopped liver? (laughs) But look at my mug, Brad. Do you have any comment on my mug? It's a fairy tale creature. It's Bigfoot, but this is like the nexus of two of my favorite things. Oh, I didn't Bigfoot even notice and that. Christmas. You see this little Christmas tree he's carrying behind him? I do. Anyways, that's my uh, coffee receptacle this morning. Mary Elise, have we talked about Bigfoot? I don't think we've talked about Bigfoot. I don't think so. Not while I've been here. You're probably the better for it, so we'll leave it at that. Um, you're okay. not, you're not well, going to ask me where I'm going this weekend? Brad, where are you going this weekend? I'm going to San Antonio to see Billy Joel and Sting. Are you really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> With your mom, right? Yeah. She's coming into town. She's it's a be big so Billy Joel fan. So yeah. We're going well, down there. Well, as soon as he plays Piano Man, I need to know because I, it's a, it's a song me and a couple of my friends just, we uh, play every time we road trip. So I think you should definitely let me know. Great song. I hope he oh, well. touches all the hits, including We Didn't Start the Fire, which I know every word <laughs> okay. of. Okay. Yeah. If that happens, I need to figure out how to contact your mother because she will need to video you <laughs> singing every song and losing your mind because that would just bring so much joy. Okay. You'll have to bribe her. We'll see what, she, we'll, we'll see what we can do. We'll see what we can do. Um, okay. Well, looking at this, we have so much to get into, you guys. So we're going to go ahead and hop to the news. Cameron... This case, this Robert Robertson case, has pretty much consumed so much of your time the last couple of weeks, um, and it's certainly become the most talked about issue in the state at this point. Um, Tell us what's been going on. Give us the update. We have a lot of plot points to update folks on this week. Yeah, for those who have been following our reporting on this, this goes back almost a month now where we saw a letter that was... Uh, published by 
Um, around 80 different Texas House members signed on to this letter calling into question some of, of the evidence that was used to convict Robert Robertson. Um, back in 2003, he was uh, convicted of capital murder and sentenced to death uh, for the death of his two-year-old daughter, Nikki Curtis. And over the course of his sentence, he and his attorneys have continually attempted to appeal his death sentence, but without success. Um, you know, th they've even appealed all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. But he was scheduled to be executed on, I believe it was the 17th, uh, last week to the day. So um, there was quite a lot of conversations that were going on. The House Criminal Jurisprudence Committee held a hearing. Um, they initially submitted a subpoena um, to have him appear in the committee so that he could give testimony about his conviction. And this was a very unique legal maneuver, something we haven't really seen at all uh, across the country, especially here in Texas, this subpoena of a death row inmate to appear in a House committee hearing. Unpre it is unprecedented. unprecedented. As much as I hate to use the term, it is unprecedented. Yeah, so uh, this caused a uh, a big stir um, within the Texas legislature. All levels of elected officials sort of um, put different motions in front of different levels of our legal system. Uh, we actually saw the U.S., or not the U.S., the Texas Supreme Court, um, they put a stay on the execution because of this unprecedented unprecedented nature of the legal maneuver. We saw a request for a denial of this motion from the House Committee um, that was filed by the Texas Attorney General where they argued that Robertson's appearance in the committee lacked jurisdiction uh, by use of the subpoena. Like I mentioned, the subpoena was upheld by the Supreme Court of Texas and Rob Robertson's execution was stayed while a district court could review this unique legal maneuver. And the day before Robertson was actually set to appear in the committee, questions began to arise about him being physically present in Austin at the Capitol to give testimony. There was um, conversations regarding his diagnosed autism, where his attorneys were arguing him giving testimony virtually would not be feasible. The Texas Attorney General um, put out a statement in regard to the feasibility of transporting Robertson to the Capitol and how there were public safety concerns um, for that aspect, because he is a death row inmate. Um, he did not end up appearing in person or virtually during this hearing that was scheduled, but uh, Representative Joe Moody did indicate that the committee is weighing options for how to have Robertson provide testimony. Jeff Leach even um, suggested that the committee could take a field trip to hear testimony from Robertson. Uh, during this hearing, though, uh, it did take place. We saw uh, testimony, invited testimony uh, from a number of celebrities, including Dr. Phil. Uh, we saw the novelist John Grisham, who's actually a member of the board for the Innocence Project, who has been heavily involved in Ro Roberson's case. He gave testimony. A interesting piece of testimony that was given, invited testimony, was from Terry Compton, who was a former juror. Um, on the uh, during the trial who during this committee hearing said that quote I would have found him not guilty and there was a lot of conversation that was had during this committee hearing about how the house members were focusing on how the state during the trial used a shaken baby syndrome um, argument as 
the main justification for the conviction. And they have had medical experts and legal experts come in and um, make attempts to cast doubt on the shaken baby syndrome that was used to convict Roberson. There was even a former uh, criminal court of appeals judge who talked about the issues regarding the appeals process that um, the current uh, uh, criminal court of appeals has uh, taken with how they viewed Roberson's case. So there was lots of information that was presented by this House committee. And a interesting, another interesting <laughs> development that came out around the same time was uh, Governor Greg Abbott has been silent throughout this process, but he, his general counsel actually submitted an argument where they were saying, where this argument was laying the groundwork for how the House Committee overstepped its legal jurisdiction with the subpoena of Robertson. This was really the first time that we heard um, anything come out of the Governor Greg, uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> Greg Abbott's camp here. And so it's just been very interesting to see because um, one of the arguments that Abbott's general counsel um, presented was, I'll just read here, quote, nowhere does the Constitution even Im impliedly suggest, much less expressly permit as the separation of power, powers clause requires that the legislative branch can cut it in again at the end. There is no reason to delay. So it was interesting to finally see Abbott or his general counsel deliver this argument and you know we've had even further developments since then yeah I, absolutely can i jump in on this oh thing? go ahead brad um, yeah yeah this obviously the the most immediate issue here is this man's life and whether he's guilty or innocent right but this debate has a lot of um follow-ups to it including especially the separation of powers fight and what this entails. Is this a legit maneuver, the subpoena? Um, are the fears about the Texas legislature basically overruling any execution down the road? Are those legit or not? Um, you know, the, the court has punted on massive questions of separation of powers before, specifically on the Texas Disaster Act related to the governor. But now they have this case before them, and they can't really avoid this, I don't think. Um, this is not something that's really going to go away mm -hmm. like COVID did. Um, so this is something that the court's going to have to grapple with, and I think we saw in the um, Evan Young kind of concurring opinion that they're going to grapple with that. Where, this, where that shakes out, I don't know, but this is like this is straight out of Schoolhouse Rock, the differences between the two, the three branches, which one's predominant, which legislature is predominant. Uh, just ask James Madison. But um, that doesn't mean that the legislature <laughs> is not violating its uh, authority here, right? So yeah. um, on top of the greatly consequential debate over guilt or innocence, uh, you know, a man's life and justice for a dead child, you have this. A profound legal fight, yeah. um, a fight over civics, essentially. Yeah, and you wrote up a great newsletter in fourth reading exploring this, so I encourage everyone to go read that. But um, I'll, the latest update that we have, um, because putting the separation of powers issue aside just for a moment, um, the controversy surrounding this case is really about this shaken baby syndrome and how the House Committee has emphasized how the state used shaken baby syndrome as the main justification for conviction. And what we saw this week was actually the Attorney General's office released a number of documents that cast doubt on the pure speculation of shaken baby syndrome that was used by the state. Because as a part of these documents, 
um, that was released included the original autopsy report and also a sort of timeline of how Roberson allegedly has changed his story through the years about how he handled re not just reporting the initial incident, but um, how he was involved in the incident itself. So I'll just read a little bit here that uh, as part of this press release from the Attorney General's office, they say they, they did this uh, for the reason, quote, to correct falsehoods amplified by a coalition interfering with the capital punishment proceedings. And they allege um, in some of these documents how Roberson had, quote, a history of violently abusing his daughter. They also, in this press release, include information about how witnesses testified during the trial that Roberson would, quote, whip his daughter when she cried. Also included in this release from the Attorney General Office um, is a graphic description of a police report claiming that Roberson admitted to a cellmate that he, quote, sexually assaulted and physically abused his daughter. So this is sort of two sides of this story coming to light now. Um, I think much of the public uh, has gr gripped on to the shaken baby syndrome uh, and much of the House Committee has focused on that. And that's been the focus of conversation. But with the Attorney General releasing these documents, I think it sort of paints the broader picture of everything that was involved in the conviction and telling the full story about why this conviction actually came out the way that it did. Uh, we did see uh, Representative Joe Moody release a statement on the uh, after the release of these documents where he characterized it as, quote, a collection of exaggerations, misrepres misrepresentations, and full-on untruths completely divorced from fact and context. So Moody really uh, standing strong on his convictions that the information that him and his committee have presented um, is what should be taken as um, the, the truth of the, the matter here. Um, they said that they do intend to have a more full response uh, published today um, that might undermine some of the claims made by the Office of the Attorney General. So this is just further complicating the uh, real issue at hand where uh, it's guilt or innocence. There, There is a child that is dead at, at the end of all this. Um, and what to do next is really unclear at this point not just on the facts of the case, but the facts of the separation of powers issues that Brad has talked about. So uh, this is a case that uh, is going to stay in the news cycle, continue to be debated for not just the next couple of weeks, I'm sure for the next year, two years, as the legislature is going to convene for the 89th session. I'm sure we're going to see um, not just the separation of powers issue addressed, but also the junk, junk science writ that was um, passed a few years ago that addressed some of the issues that the House Committee has brought up in terms of uh, if debunked science was used to convict a um, uh, convict someone in court, they can challenge uh, that conviction. So they've talked about clarifying those rules. So we're going to see this case and the issues at hand extend into the legislative session. And yeah, just continue following my my Twitter and continue following the Texan because um, we'll uh, keep putting up new stuff as things come out.
And Cameron has done a phenomenal job of covering all of this from start to finish. I remember when he first pitched the story and said, hey, by the way, there's this guy, Robert Robertson, we should probably report on this. And that was before anything had snowballed at all, right? I mean, this has certainly um, consumed so much of the news cycle in Texas and taken a lot of the air nationally, too. Um, And I would just encourage folks to go read his coverage and you know, fair warning. There are very graphic details contained in the articles and the autopsy. Um, certainly worth understanding, uh, considering the gravity of the situation. And like the boys have said, um, there is a two-year-old child that is no longer here um, as a result of this case. And so this is certainly something that is horrific and difficult. And um, the uh, just beware when you go and read these pieces of the of the contents of everything. Because and it's certainly there's a um, lot I left out. Um, <laughs> you know, I talked for almost 15 minutes about this and there's a lot that I didn't cover. Um, yeah. And I, it, I'd encourage people to go read the reporting that we've done on this. And there's going to be more stuff that comes out um, that is going to further complicate the issues that have already been presented. Like um, someone... <laughs> Brad has alerted me to his, um, what, what's the radio host's name? Mark Davis. Mark Davis has been covering this quite a bit. And he, uh, this week actually, had on uh, Nikki Curtis's older brother, who gave s- some very interesting insight into Robert Robertson, the person, before he was convicted. I, I highlighted one of those aspects on my X feed if people are interested in checking that out. Um, because, you know, (laughs) there's things that are presented to us about this case in the media, things that are presented to us, um, by the house committee. Um, but ultimately it's, we, it's, it's not going to become clear. Um, yeah, it's, it's a very complex case. Like I, there's there's going to be something that happens eventually in January because there is a stay that expires um, after 90 days and that 90 days is up in January. So we, we might have an answer by then, but right now it's just going to be more and more information coming out and hopefully um, people can try to sort through it themselves. Um, But, you know, our, the legislative branch, the governor, the Supreme Court, they're going to have to make a decision on this pretty soon. And I'll certainly, just like Cameron did plug our newsletters, Brad wrote about the constitutionality and separation of powers at play here in all of this in fourth reading this week. It comes out on Tuesdays. Cameron will have um, you know, his own newsletter relating to all of this and specifically the death penalty on Monday. So go subscribe to the Texan and we'll continue to provide essentially just what's presented to us, right? What's coming out, um, what's being presented by lawmakers, by elected officials throughout this entire hearing and this process um, and updates as we as we receive them. So um, go check it out at the Texan and make sure to subscribe. Cameron, thank you for breaking all that down for us and continuing to follow such a difficult story. Um, Mary Elise, let's pivot here. Early voting has begun in Texas. Yes. Give us the details. Yeah, kind of a, a shift of topics, but The 2024 general election has begun in Texas. Early voting kicked off about three days ago on October 21st. So in addition to the presidential election, Texas has begun voting across the ballot for 39 federal positions, including one U.S. Senate seat and 38 of Texas's congressional seats in the U.S. House, plus multiple statewide elections, including 24 state senators and 135 state representatives. And after the presidential election, um, definitely the most high profile race in Texas is the U.S. Senate race between Senator Ted Cruz and Congressman Colin Allred, which Brad has covered extensively. Um, There's also a few noteworthy congressional races happening. So there's in the 15th congressional district um, between Congresswoman Monica De La Cruz and Democrat Michelle Vallejo. And then in the 34th between Congressman Vincent Gonzalez and then the former Congresswoman, Myra Flores. So the article also has a whole list of seats in the Texas Supreme Court that are also in the ballot um, and just other notable races across the state. There's a whole list there. Um, And the Secretary of State does provide a personalized ballot by county, which we link in the story. 
you can go on there and type in your county and get yourself a personalized ballot, see what's going to, um, what you'll be voting for exactly. And then early voting will end on Friday, November 1st. And then polls will open again four days later on November 5th, election day. I'm um, open at 7 a.m. So take advantage of that um, and definitely go check out the article because there's links and other helpful information you should know. Absolutely. And Mary, this is a great job of compiling that all for folks. So they can find that easily. We have a um, list of voting resources in all 254 counties as well. We have all sorts of election resources at the Texan, so check that out. And um, Mary Elise, thank you for your coverage. Brad, let's stick on this early vote topic. You received reports that Republican early vote turnout is significantly higher compared to 2020. Give us those details. Yeah, so caveat all this with the fact that it is two days through early voting, Monday and Tuesday, but that is a massive amount of the overall early vote. We see the turnout generally during early vote bookended on each side, the first two days, the last two days. First two days as people are the ones really excited to vote, go cast their ballot, see long lines on those days, and we see long lines on the last days as people try and get to the polls after having put it off for a week and a half or so. So take that for what it's worth. But that said, through two, two days of early voting, uh, more than 1.9 million voters have cast ballots across the state, either in person or by mail. That's roughly 10% turnout so far. Um, so bro break that down into uh, partisan modeling, and you have, uh, in 2024, that total amount is modeled at 47% Republican compared to 34% Democratic. Now, four years ago in 2020, uh, Republicans put uh, a lot of criticism and concern on the idea of voting early, especially by, ma by mail, but early at all. Um, There's a lot of push for Republicans to go turn out on election day and make that your when you go run or when you go vote. Um, but so th that's, that's what happened in context. That is not the same this time around. So in 2020, the percentage breakdown was 37% GOP, 47% Democratic. So they basically have flipped. And that's a very good sign for Republicans. Um, Ross Hunt of Hunt Research, he's the one that sent me the the data uh, with his modeling, and the modeling is based on not just primary vote history, but demographic breakdown, which way they kind of lean partisan-wise. It's just a projection. So, you know, there's error in that, of course, but um, these data guys do a lot of work, and they, um, they usually have it pretty close to right. At the margins, it may, it may shift. But so Ross, um, his model, his electorate model has the 2024 Texas electorate nine points more Republican than in 2020 through two days, hmm. uh, projecting the GOP to have a, a plus 8.73% advantage so far. So that's a, bi that's a big shift. That's a massive shift. Uh, Ross told me, quote, we're seeing a significant GOP surge to vote early. It's too early to see if this is just front loading the vote or if it's a real pattern showing larger Republican turnout. I lean towards the latter. So obviously this is po it's possible this is just cannibalizing the election day vote for Republicans or what would be the traditional election day vote. But it may also be um, may also be significant gains. And for example, Ross told me that uh, in 2020, the combination of new young Hispanic voters, so voters that fit that uh, that those three categories, uh, new voters being those who have not cast a ballot in the last five general elections, um, young voters obviously, and then Hispanics. They in 2020 they went to Democrats at a two to one clip. That's flipped entirely. It's now Republicans mm -hmm. at a two to one clip. Now obviously it's early. Who knows how long that if that if that holds? But um, you know that's showing significant gains for Republicans among a constituency they didn't previously have. So. Uh, very fascinating stuff in these early returns, but um, yeah, we'll see how it how it pans out later.
Absolutely. And I think it's fair noting as well that, of course, um, this is the first two days, but this is the only data we have at this point. So it's exciting. It's fun to see. And it is indicative of something. So let's see what that is. Right. And we already have, we're recording Thursday. We already have information coming out about day three of early voting. So we'll keep folks updated on all of this because there's a lot going on um, and certainly information trickling out day by day. And Brad, can you quickly explain what you mean by uh potential cannibalization of votes like explain what that means before we head into how mail ballots yeah, are breaking down certainly so can campaigns the parties you know telling their voters uh strategically either go vote early go vote on election day A cannibalization would be basically just moving the voters that you would get on election day as, a, as for example republicans pushing them to vote early and just basically moving that ball earlier in the process, banking the votes earlier than you would already have them. Mm -hmm. So it's not really, if that's the case, it's not really changing anything in terms of the larger partisan makeup of how this these elections are gonna shake out. Yeah. But it is changing the voter habits mm. in terms of when they vote. So that's why the, the hesitation is to claim, oh, this is, massive GOP gains, because we don't know that for sure yet. There are some signs of that, but it might just be advancing, moving upward the um, the Republican votes that would have already come on election day. Yeah, and I, does this, is this gonna relate to how um, voting totals are gonna be reported? Like if they vote, if people are voting early, those votes are going to be counted earlier, so those results are going to show up earlier? Yeah, they'll show up early on. They'll be the, the first returns shown across the state. Um, okay. you know, on election night, they almost right after polls close, usually probably a half hour after polls close, the early vote is, has already been totaled and it's loaded up to the websites mm -hmm. and published first. Then, of course, we have the waiting game for election day returns to come in and, and be processed yeah so yeah that could give republicans a boost in the early vote yeah um if this holds but it's not necessarily indicative of a larger change in the electorate. well the reason i bring it up is just to prepare people who are listening or who watch these vote totals as they roll in on election day like how the numbers can flip back and forth. And it mm -hmm. m might seem like, why is that happening? Well, it's because some votes, some people are coming out way early and those vote totals are coming out earlier than some people are coming out the day of and those vote totals might be tallied later in the night. Mm -hmm. And so it could flip right. the numbers um, just to prepare people yeah. for how those numbers go up and down. Yeah. Brad, um can you break down how mail ballots are trending in this? So this is another good sign for Republicans. Democrats always dominate the mail ballot voting. That's They stress that to their voters constantly. Now in Texas, of course, you can only vote by mail if you're over 65 or disabled, um, or I think, a, or if you're out of your home county during the early vote election day period. So, um, it's, so it's maybe limited. like college kids, if they go to a a school outside of their home. Yeah, that is part of it, yeah. Um, but usually, for the most part, it's over 65 mm -hmm. and disabled. So Democrats stress that constantly. Um, in 2020, they had a 15-point advantage on that, on that breakdown, partisan breakdown in, in uh, Hunt's modeling. But that's been halved so far through two two days this year. And so, you know, that, that tells you Republicans have stemmed the bleeding on this from a partisan breakdown wise. Mm. Um, now, I think the important caveat to this is um, Derek Ryan, another Republican data analyst, he does these reports, recommends subscribing to them if, if you're interested in this stuff, puts them out every day during early voting showed, he said that uh, mail balloting is substantially down from multiple of the last elections. So uh, 2020 is a bit of an anomaly because of COVID. Mm -hmm. So take that out of it. The 2016 election had 507,000 mail ballot votes through two days. 
and this year so far it's only 193,000. So wow. less than half. Um, what do you think attributes to that? I, I don't know. I really don't know. Interesting. Um, you know, you could say less enthusiasm for Democrats because they're the ones that really push their voters to vote by mail. Um, also, Republicans, while they're not as against voting early this time as they were in 2020, they're still critical of voting by mail because mm. of election um, election concerns. Yeah. So I think that it's probably some of both there mm. in Texas, but overall, I'm not not entirely sure. That's just my guess. Yeah. So. Can you also talk about South Texas? Because I think that's where so many folks have their eye on this election and in the last several elections, right? This is the hotbed. We're looking at how demographics are shifting, specifically when it comes to general elections. Walk us through what this modeling is about South Texas. Sure. So Hunt, in his modeling, he separates, you know, South Texas is large, includes San Antonio down to the Valley, Corpus Christi. I think it might even include El Paso. Um, so it, it's very large. He splits it up into two. He splits it up into San Antonio and then everything else. So among the San Antonio metropolitan areas uh, rating here, the 2024 electorate is 13 points more Republican, sorry, 11 points more Republican than it was four years ago. Um, it went from a D plus seven in 2020 through the first two days to R plus four. Mm. So that's a pretty big shift in San Antonio, and that probably wow. bodes well, at least right now, for the, the specifically two house races that are highly contested in that county. Um, in the rest of South Texas, the modeling went from D plus 24 years ago to D plus 14 this year. Wow. So that's a six-point gain for Republicans just on the partisan breakdown perspective. And, and, the, and these are people that are registered Democrat or Republican? No one's registered in Texas. It, it, it's oh, based yeah, on, huh? Yeah, it's based yeah. on, like, primary history, oh, okay. demographic breakdown, projections on the partisan leaning of those demographics. Right. So okay. it, it's more complicated than that. Um, and, of course, as I said earlier, may have some error, but generally it's, it's, it's pretty spot on. Um, so... You know, El Paso is heavily Democratic, so that's going to skew it more left. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you might have some more. The Valley is still Democratic territory, but the Republicans are making substantial gains there. So, like, you know, if you isolated just the Valley, you'd probably have, it probably would be closer to even. You'd probably still favor Democrats, but not, like, D14. Mm -hmm. I think... El Paso is probably skewing things quite a bit there, mm. um, as are you know other, certain other parts of, of South Texas. But South Texas is still Democratic territory. Um, and the last thing I'll touch on is that on turnout, internal GOP projections that I've heard estimate total turnout to reach around 12.5 million. Uh, if that comes true, the total turnout would be about on par with the 2020 level, which was two thirds. 66, 67 percent. Um, Hunt told me he thinks that's probably a bit high. He sees it coming in between 12 million and 12.3 million, so the turnout percentage wouldn't drop by that much. But um, you know, regardless, we'll we'll see probably a record turnout in the number of raw voters. I think mm. um, how that breaks down percentage-wise varies, but. It's um, clearly people are motivated to vote. You know, we have 1.9 million people already having cast ballots. Well, I'm, I'm as of Tuesday, as I, through Tuesday. I'm interested to see uh, the outcomes here regarding uh, if people are going to vote down ticket the same as they vote for the presidential race. Because are we going to see Trump voters? but then they vote for Democratic candidates at, bo at the bottom of the ticket or they're Kamala voters and they vote Republican down ticket. You know, it, that's an interesting sort of dynamic at play. Are yeah. we going to, you know, with the president in the Senate race, two very um, spotlighted races, you know, we could see Trump all red voters yeah. and we could see Harris Cruz voters, you know. Well, that's, that's been a big debate 
do Trump all red voters actually exist? I can tell you anecdotally, I know one. And I'm pretty sure he is, he voted against Cruz because of the whole sports curse thing. <laughs> but um, there is one, at least. Okay. So we'll see if it comes in and in any, you know, significant manner. But yeah, it does exist. Yeah. Maybe not the best sample size, uh, considering the sports, you know, angle there. But we'll, we'll take it. At least anecdotally, Bride knows of one Trump Allward voter that exists. Are you saying a sample size of one isn't sufficient? Yes. Interesting. Yes, I am. Huh. Okay. Um, let's pivot to some actual races that we're watching here. Brad, we're going to stick with you. There's a very high profile race in the Valley. Uh, it's a rematch in the 34th congressional district. What's your read on the race so far? So it is a rematch between Democrat incumbent Vicente Gonzalez and Republican challenger Myra Flores. She is a former congresswoman. She held the seat for like six months. Gonzalez defeated her in 22 last cycle after he moved congressional districts. Um, so we're, yeah, we have a rematch here. And it's been pretty, uh, pretty intense. They've been throwing a lot of punches at each other. The, the NRCC is coming in. We're seeing the um, biological men, males and female sports issue at play quite a bit. Um, the, the pair have grappled over the border. It's a border district, of course. So overall, though, I think Flores is a bit behind the eight ball just based on the partisan breakdown of the district. I think it's, if I recall, D5758. Mm. So that's a pretty difficult margin to overcome in one cycle. Um, you know, I would, if I were betting on this, I would not bet on Flores winning the seat. However, in 22, she did outperform the partisan rating of the district at the time. Mm. I think she about halved it. So What year was this? 22. 22? Yeah. What was the big issue at the time in 22? Border course um the economy yeah probably same sort of stuff that yeah I mean, <laughs> it, it hasn't changed that much you know the big yeah. the big change we've seen is this biological males and female sports and then i think a, a different twist on abortion abortion yeah. is still an issue but it's a different twist yeah. this time around so uh yeah it's largely the same stuff in there they debated last week uh, i went through and you know i transcribed some of their their responses on the border, on the uh, sports issue, on abortion. Mm -hmm. um, so you can check it out in the piece there. Uh, but yeah, there's these two candidates really haven't changed. Mm. They haven't changed at all, really, since well, the last time. Well, if the individual candidates haven't changed, has the electorate changed? Well, that's the question. If, if you, you're to take the South Texas returns that I mentioned above on early vote, it would indicate, yes, they have. Yeah. Is it enough to flip the script? I, I don't know, but yeah. things are changing, of course. And you know, these wedge issues are working. You know, when you have Colin Allred give a direct to camera response to these sports ads, yeah, you know it's working yeah. behind the scenes, and that's that reflects everything I heard before this really came out and hit the ground of it being the biggest mover of undecideds, particularly on fave on fave against all red or any Democrat who voted. So it, so it's the issues have evolved, not the electorate has, you know, sort of their, the demographics have changed of the electorate. Is it just there are these new niche issues that have more of an importance? I think some of both. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, you have new voters coming in yeah. who haven't voted before with new priorities and, and new outlooks. Um, you know, Republicans are banking heavily on young males who n traditionally almost never vote yeah. coming out and voting against Democrats because they're on uh, mostly cultural issues. All right. Then you have Hispanics being targeted by Republicans um, politically for, on like economy, mm. on the economy, on the border, you know? So they're banking on that, whether it works is, you know, an open question, but they're seeing something there. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they wouldn't be spending their money on this, yeah. right? And yeah. same for the Democrats on abortion. You know, that that's huge. Um, you know, there's a rhyme to the reason 
that they're doing this. And so they, they see their internal polling, and um, you know, it's just a question of which outweighs which. And I'd encourage folks, Brad wrote on a very heated debate between Gonzalez and Flores. That was very interesting. So I'd certainly go read those details, especially if you are in this district. It gives great insight into the candidates and what issues they're going head to head on right now. Um, Brad, thank you for your coverage. Mary Elise, we're going to come to you. House District 52 is among the battleground districts this election, specifically in the Texas House. Tell us more about it. Yes. So State Representative Caroline Harris de Villa is running against her Democratic challenger, Jenny Burkholz, in the general election. And this district, HD 52, House District 52, has been targeted by both sides of the aisle um, because they both see it as grounds for a potential win. Um, And this is because Williamson County has a rapidly growing population and it appears to be shifting a bit closer to purple. Um, And this huge population growth happened right after... um, a billion dollar Samsung facility planted its roots in Williamson, in Williamson County in the town of Taylor. And then that sparked a zoning fight and caused the district to flip from a blue to red majority. After the 2022 election, HG52 um, has maintained a Republican leaning of R55%. And that's according to the Texans, um, Texas Partisan Index. And that was when Harris de Villa first won her position as the district's representative in 2022. So I spoke to her and she said she seems skeptical that the district is even a toss up. She said everyone and I quote everyone moving to HD 52 values safety and security, keeping taxes low and supporting our local businesses and schools. These are the values that Republicans have championed and will continue to uphold. Um, I also spoke to Burke Holes and she said that as far as HG52 goes, overwhelmingly the voters of the district are concerned, in her opinion, about the lack of public school funding and underfunded mandates and reproductive freedom, so abortion access. Um, Burkholz also touched upon the fact that, when speaking to her, that Harris Sevilla is pro school choice, which is obviously one of the hot button issues for this, um, for Texas in this election in the upcoming legislative session. Um, it's it's worth noting that for Governor Greg Abbott to achieve his plan for Texas school choice um, in the upcoming legislative session, he's going to need as many Republicans in the House who will vote in favor of it. Um, so someone like Harris Davila is an important, um, you know, she's pro school choice, so she would be an important win for him. Um, so there's all the details of that race. Um, it's going to be an interesting one to watch. And so you can check out all the details in the actual article. Absolutely. Definitely go check it out. Williamson County is uh, certainly a hotbed of election activity, as uh, particularly in the last few cycles, and this cycle is no different. So go read Mary Lisa's coverage there, and you're so right about school choice. We need um, you know, to see what happens there, and Abbott is very keen on keeping those Republicans who voted for school choice in the House. Um, Cameron, let's come to you. House District 70. This is a very much a battleground district in North Texas. Tell us about the two candidates there. Yeah, uh, located in Collin County, it's experienced a rapid demographic change from recent years, and there's been a lot invested in the outcome of this HD70 race. Um, It's rated D52, so very much a purple district that could be seen as a potential flip for Republicans. But this is a battle between the incumbent state representative Mahela Plesa and Republican challenger Steve Kennard. Um, CBS Texas actually sat down with both these candidates, and I watched both these uh, these interviews to try and get a better sense of what they're going to be bringing to this race. And it was very interesting. Um, Plesa made note during her interview that the she said, "quote This district was drawn to protect two." Inc- incumbent Republicans, and she was, asked, she was asked about Abbott's previous comments about how the district could flip Republican, and plus uh, retorted with, bring it. <laughs> so uh, it seems like she's very up for the challenge. Um, she has really uh, been a more progressive member uh, in the Texas House, uh, and she really uh, got a name for herself by using points of order 
motions during the 88th regular session to really scuttle some legislation related to voter registration information. So she has made a name for herself for being such a young member. Um, and Steve Kennard, uh, he's really been involved since he has won the um, Republican nomination. He's been involved with the Reform Caucus um, regarding the Texas House Speaker race and um, really trying to up his name ID and presence with this involvement with um, already elected members. And when he sat down with uh, CBS Texas, he said, uh, quote, fundamentally, Collin County wants a pro-family, pro-liberty kind of candidate. Uh, he wants to prioritize border security, talked a lot about the crisis at the southern border. And, you know, he's really emphasized school choice and really the idea of uh, public education and this idea of decentralization. Um, you know, he has uh, previously worked on with uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, so that sort of messaging playing into other aspects uh, of issues that he's talked about. And leading into the primary election, Plesa, uh, she's raised uh, $661,000 and spent Four hundred and fifty-eight thousand, while Canards raised one hundred and twenty-seven thousand and spent seventy-one thousand. So, lots of money coming into this district for both these candidates, and with it being rated very much um, right down the middle at D fifty-two percent, you know, could be uh, an, a, a race people are going to be watching to see if it can flip. So, very interesting. And this is one of those races where it will impact the speaker's race, right? This could be, a, you know, a swap for Republicans. Um, and if these early voting numbers turn out to be consistently seen throughout early voting and election day with Republicans coming out in droves, it'll be very interesting to see um, if we uh, see this Republican heading to the House and replacing a Democrat. School choice goes into this, right? This is one of those races that's very key for Republicans when it comes to the legislative session and being able to pass certain very difficult and heavy lifting <laughs> policy issues across the finish line here. So we'll keep an eye on that, Cameron. Thanks for your coverage. Mary Elise, we got two stories from you and we'll head to our tweetery here. Texas Attorney General sent a letter to the FEC, the Federal Election Commission, about a Democratic fundraising organization. Tell us about it. Yes. Before I tell you about it real quick, I just wanted to correct. I said that um, the growth in, for HD52 caused the re- um, caused the switch from blue to red, but I just wanted to clarify that the redistricting caused HD52 to flip from blue to red. So just a quick correction there. Um, yes, Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton sent a petition to the Federal Election Commission, FEC, and he demanded that it close certain loopholes to prevent this Democratic Fundraising Operation Act Blue um, from allegedly participating in illicit activity, which he has been investigating since December 2023. Um, and he first began looking into Act Blue after concerns were raised that a large number of suspicious donations were being made through the platform through Act Blue um, by unidentified donors who had allegedly labeled their identity as other unaware individuals. Paxton joined a coalition of 19 Republican state attorneys in this ongoing criminal investigation into Act Blue's allegedly illegal fundraising tactics. And the, the general allegation here is that large donations have been funneled through Act Blue by way of millions of small dollar um, donations using these prepaid cards under the names of people who didn't authorize the payment. Um, and Paxson's petition recommends certain regulations to prevent this from happening. Um, one of them is that he suggests requests eliminating prepaid cards as an acceptable, acceptable form of payment and implementing procedures that would ensure that the identity provided by a donor entirely matches information that the donor's card issuer has on, fire, on file about that donor. And in the petition, Paxton alleges that certain donations under the names of people who have denied doing so are being made in such high volume that regardless of investigation, he says, it strains credibility to believe that they're being made by the persons whose names are provided by the contributor. And he concluded his petition to the FEC just saying, 
I'm calling on the FEC to immediately begin rulemaking to secure elections for many criminal actors exploiting these vulnerabilities. So this will be an interesting one to keep an eye on, see what FEC's response is, and lots of news around the election. So this will be interesting. Absolutely. And Attorney General Paxton certainly making a lot of these moves as we head into election season. And the last month, we've seen a flurry of these kinds of moves. So we'll keep an eye on this one specifically. Let's pivot here. Mary Lee's off election coverage for a second. You spoke with the San Antonio Police Department um, about uh, this specific gang that we've covered plenty at the Texan um, and their activity in the city of San Antonio. Tell us about it. Tell us about this gang. Yes. So I spoke with the San Antonio Police Department, and they confirmed that members of the Venezuelan gang, Trende Ragua, took over certain vacant apartments in San Antonio, and this was in early October. But there are unconfirmed reports of gang members occupying up to four complexes. Um, The police department reported, and I quote, on October 5th, multiple law enforcement agencies conducted an operation at the Palacio Apartments in San Antonio and arrested 19 people, including four members of TDA criminal gang who had taken over vacant apartments and were engaged in illicit activities. And the Daily Mail reported a few days ago that TDA gang members had taken over four apartment complexes after squatting in the Palacio apartments for the prior five to six months. And they allege that they've been renting units to fellow illegal aliens and using the space as a um, as a spot for human trafficking, prostitution, or drug deals. Um, And the police department responded to this and other online speculations. They said they are aware of recent social media posts regarding alleged gang takeovers of other apartment complexes in San Antonio. But they said at this time, we have no credible information to support this information. And just two days before the early arrest in October in San Antonio that I mentioned previously, um, the two days after that, the Texas Department of Public Safety announced the arrest of one TDA member in Houston, actually, with the last name Cova. He um, was a 32-year-old illegal alien from Venezuela, and he's now in custody at the Brazoria County Jail. Um, and allegedly, Cova was recruiting middle schoolers to join the gang, which is an interesting thing to note. Um, and to back this all up, Um, About a month ago, Governor Greg Abbott signed a proclamation declaring the specific group, this gang, to be a foreign terrorist organization. And currently, he is offering a $5,000 reward for any information on suspected TDA members that have been involved in criminal activity. So um, hopefully his steps will help decrease their activity in Texas. But until then, we'll be covering it and watching it closely. Absolutely. Thank you, Mary Elise. Let's go on to the Twittery section, guys. It's about time. Brad, um, it's been a while since we chatted. What do you got for your Twittery this week? Yeah, I've just been sitting here in the dunce corner. Um, I have, well, no reaction to that. It's unfortunate. <laughs> Awkward. Um, so in one of these contested Bear County seats, um, Specifically, HG 121, you have Republican Mark LaHood against Democrat Laurel Swift. Uh, I covered the rate. There was a debate a week or two ago. You can read about that on the on the Texan.news. But what came about this week was retiring San Antonio State Rep. Steve Allison. Retiring, of course, because LaHood defeated him in the um, in the primary this year. He is endorsing Swift, the Democrat, against LaHood, the Republican. Mm. So Allison, of course, the Republican, he voted against, or voted to strip education savings accounts from the edu- from the omnibus bill last November. And that sparked the Abbott-funded primary against him, including from, or specifically here from LaHood. So um, Allison told Corn Reports in this, I'm supporting and voting for her as the better and more qualified candidate and encouraging others to do the same. Obviously, uh, you know, some will argue this is just, um, you know, spoiled grapes, um, sour grapes, that's the term. (laughs) Sour grapes. And, um, you know, others will argue that Allison, of course, would 
side with the person who's against edu education savings accounts, vouchers, whatever you want to call them, against the person who is, since that was the reason he was primaried in the first place. Regardless, um, you know, it, it, La Hood's team is, is sweating, mm. but I wouldn't put them in the same camp as Lujan, who, the, one, the district next door, which is very much a dead even split district. Well, it still has an advantage partisan breakdown wise. Um, you know, I think he's likelier to win on election night than Lujan is. They might both win, they might both lose, I don't know. But I think he's more likely to win. So we'll see if Allison's endorsement holds any weight. He's been in the seat since former Speaker Joe Strauss retired. Mm. So he wasn't in there for a long time, but he, uh, he, the district is a, a pretty moderate district, and Allison rep reflected that. LaHood, who used to be a Democrat, um, depending on your perspective, either reflects that or doesn't reflect that. So, um, you know, it, it's probably a mix of, of a few things mm -hmm. that Allison decided to do this. So, Absolutely. Very spicy stuff. I always love this kind of, it's just so different being on the side of it and reporting on all of it. It's, I love the spice of these kind of cross party uh endorsements and uh grudges held after a primary it is fascinating stuff it's so fun also brad i did not mean to leave you hanging i just didn't understand what you said hmm. oh, i forget what i said so i'm not going to rehash it i'll listen to the podcast tomorrow you can, and yeah, find you can out. roll back the tape i'll roll back the tape and this will be uh a non-issue once i'm back in the office i'll be able to hear all your snarky comments in person so praise the lord for that um cameron let's go to you what you got? Uh, well, Texas State University in San Marcos is getting a huge uh, archive of Cormac McCarthy material. Uh, for, I don't know if anyone else is a Cormac McCarthy fan. Uh, I'm a. I read Blood Meridian, um, The Road. I haven't read his other works, but. No Country for Old Men, he wrote, um, and that was Great movie. a fantastic movie. But, yeah, the Texas State University is getting this. Uh, they acquired 36 boxes filled with McCarthy's private journals, photos, correspondence, manuscripts of unpublished novels, and research materials. That what he, school is this? Texas State University oh, in nice. San Marcos. Nice. So I just thought that was interesting for anyone who's a Cormac McCarthy fan. Um, have you, Mackenzie or Mary Elise, are, are you guys Cormac McCarthy fans? Have you read any of his books? I haven't. Not very familiar not with really it. Now I want to. <laughs> <laughs> not really up there, Allie. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Brad makes a lot of assumptions, Mary Elise, about what might be. Oh, are you are you so into we'll... brutal descriptions of <laughs> Indians scalping uh, Texans oh, and vice versa? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're very brutal novels. Yeah, yeah maybe yeah. not. Maybe that maybe that wasn't quite an unfair generalization to make. Um, we'll have to do some research, Mary Elise, and find out if that is if if, if we can stomach it for the plot and the I, story. I wouldn't mm -hmm. start with Bl Blood Meridian <laughs> if you got to pick up one of his novels. Probably start with The Road. <laughs> the Road. Okay. okay. Yeah, that's, that's good. To that's know. a uh, that's a more gentle gentle introduction to his work. So this is the start of the Texans Book Club. Ooh. Yeah. We could do that. New podcast. I found that ever since taking this job i've read so much less because i read all day <laughs> i read so much less than i used to which is really sad um i guess i just read for a living instead of reading for fun but brad do you agree you do the same thing have we talked about that i don't know yeah um i have many books piled on my uh nightstand and book and uh dresser that i have cracked open and then just let linger mm. yeah, yeah. So it's, it's sad. I wish I was more into reading than I am because I see books that I want to read and I buy them, of course. Yeah. I'm like, I'm going to read yeah. that. Mm -hmm. And then <laughs> I crack it open them. and I read, <laughs> you know, a couple chapters and then I'm, I'm done. Yeah. I've stopped myself from going back and looking at how many books I've read in other years <laughs> compared to now because I think it would just make me really sad. <laughs> but um, regardless, 
maybe one day we'll be able to get over that hump of, um, I don't know, reading fatigue and get back to it. Mary Elise, coming to you for your tweeter, my dear. What you got? Yeah, so this is trending on X right now, and I don't, you know, don't know all the details or anything, but um, I saw that Kamala Harris's husband has a an an accuser that's come forward and accused him of um, abuse. So that's interesting. It'll be. I think there's probably going to be a lot of things coming out on both sides as we get closer to the election. So it's, I mean, whether they're true or not. Um, so interesting, interesting development. Absolutely. Absolutely. We've, I think in these um, last, well, really it's just last week, um, week and a half or so of an election cycle, you see these um, allegations being pulled out of hats and some have a lot of substance and some don't. And so it'll be, you know, we're seeing that on both sides right now. And um, the October you know, surprise. The ugly side of the election here. Yeah. What's that, Cameron? The October surprise. I'm telling yeah. you. It gets nasty. Um, and like I said, some are very substantive and worth noting as a voter and some aren't and deciphering that is difficult. So we'll have to go look into this because mm-hmm. this is the first, like you said, Mary Lee's it's trending right now and the first we're hearing of it recording on uh, Thursday here. So fascinating. Um, okay, folks. Well, thanks so much for listening. And uh, I'm excited, gentlemen, to be back in the office with you next week. Mary Lee, we're going to have to get you to the office. It'd be so fun to record in person with you yeah. and see the office and be with and everybody. actually meet everybody in person i know it's so weird it's so weird that that has not happened mm-hmm. um but we'll make it happen folks thank you so much for listening and we will catch you next week thank you to everyone for listening if you enjoy our show rate and review us on apple Podcasts, spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts and if you want more of our stories subscribe to the texan at the texan.news follow us on social media for the latest in texas politics and send any questions for our team to our mailbag by DMing us on Twitter or shooting us an email to editor at thetexan.news. Tune in next week for another episode of our weekly roundup. God bless you and God bless Texas.